Hi, my name's Liberty and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Firestorm is an anarchist cooperative in Southern Appalachia that operates on Cherokee land. This week we're celebrating our 13th birthday. As a queer and trans collective, we offer a unique community supported space that centers books and social movement. Starting in March of last year, we moved almost everything we do online. And while we're finally reopening our space at the end of this month, yay, uh, we will continue to do virtual events like this one for the foreseeable future. Uh, I hope that you'll check out our online calendar um, and book catalog. Our co-op offers $1 shipping on in-stock titles and features a great selection of children's books, sci-fi fantasy, gardening titles, and other things that some people don't always expect to find at a radical bookstore. Tonight, we're discussing The Operating System, an anarchist theory of the modern state, uh, which was just published by AK Press. As a side note, uh, the book was delayed in printing. Um, so if you've ordered a copy from us uh, or you paid for one along with your registration tonight, uh, just know that we have shipped it and it's on its way to you. Sorry about the delay, it was sort of outside of our control. Um, so I wanna go ahead and welcome our panelists. Uh, we are fortunate to have author uh, Eric Larson, who is an independent journalist, historian, and activist. Uh, he's additionally the author of People's Pension, uh, a history of right-wing attacks on the social security system, and The Duty to Stand Aside, which focuses on anarchist pacifism uh, in World War II Britain. His work has appeared in a variety of publications, including In These Times, The Nation, The Village Voice, Counterpunch, Huffington Post, and Z Magazine. And he lives in Buckland, Massachusetts. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Uh, we, we've also got uh, Maya Ramnath, uh, who is a historian and author of Decolonizing Anarchism, uh, and more recently, uh, the Art uh, for uh, excuse me, Art for Life: Conversations with the Progressive Writers Movement on Pens, Swords, and Internationalism, from Anti-Fascism to Afro-Asian Solidarity. Uh, plus, Maya has authored uh, numerous articles on various combinations of anarchism, anti-colonialism, and uh, the South, uh, South Asian diaspora. Uh, they also wrote one of my favorite lines uh, in the foreword of this book, describing anarchists as beautiful chaos monsters <laughs> who can walk, chew gum, and juggle all while, do <laughs> all while dodging snowballs, um, which I love. <laughs> Best line uh, so in the whole book, you. actually. It, it's a pretty incredible line. Um, <laughs> So it's a, it's a huge pleasure to be able to host this event tonight as part of the Radical Publishers Alliance's uh, Radical May event series. And if you didn't know this was part of an event series, uh, then please check out the rest of the events in the series. Tons of great content coming from some of the best lefty publishers um, uh, who are at work today. Uh, before we start, I also want to acknowledge and express solidarity with Palestinians um, who are carrying out a historic general strike today uh, in response to the wave of settler violence and state attacks that have claimed almost 250 lives and left thousands seriously injured. Uh, it does seem fitting um, at this time to be discussing how states act, uh, in the words of Peter Kropotkin, as the greatest hindrance to the birth of a society based on equality and liberty, as well as the historic means designed to prevent this blossoming. Um, so I know that we will touch on um, settler colonialism and other related themes this evening, uh, but it feels really important to name what's going on around us uh, as we join each other today. But thank you so much uh, to everyone who has logged in and taken time out of your busy lives for this conversation. And with that, I'll go ahead and pass it off to Eric. Thanks a lot, Liberty. And, and um, I, I have to say that that quote from Kropotkin is incredibly apt here, uh, because in a way, what my book attempts to do is to show how the state not only is something that in our, in our day and, and our time, it's not something that just runs a government or administers uh, uh, a set of institutions, but it's something we have instead of a society. It's literally something that uh, proposes to us, instead of constructing a society for yourselves, we will do it for you. We will create a mechanism that will uh, essentially be a virtual society that you can, that you can sign on to, that you can um, 
uh, uh, work within, but it's not really a society. Uh, that's that's the, the reality of it. And I, 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 I have to thank you too for mentioning um, the, the, the historic general strike uh, by the Palestinian people, which um, in a lot of ways, and I, I won't go into it too much, but is literally uh, a revolt against the state. That's what a general strike is. And that's why it's been for so long, it's been, it's been such a big part of the anarchist toolkit, you know, broadly speaking, because it's not just a strike against a business or a set of businesses, it's a strike against the whole system that they are part of, that props them up. And that system is something that we see in a sort of a concentrated form in Israel, in the West Bank, in Gaza, <clears throat> in the way these places are administered by the, uh, the, the, the government of Israel. Uh, to back up for a second, uh, what I tried to do in this book really was to um, initially, I, I guess it grew out of a desire to understand better what the state is in our day and age. How is it different from what it was 100 years ago or 200 years ago? How is it different from, from what it was when I was a kid? You know, how is it different from, when it, from what it was in the 70s? And what I found, what I began to put together was a, a lot of through lines and that I could trace back to the, uh, the let's say, early Renaissance, which is when the, when the state system, uh, as I would call it, really started to, uh, to, uh, uh, to materialize or, 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 or come together. And there's a, there are themes and through lines that go all the way through that history, but that have accelerated in a, a tremendous way in the last 100 to 200 years. And that includes everything from technology and surveillance to fossil fuels, to uh, nuclear energy, to, uh, to the closing of the frontier in, 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 in vast parts of the world. And so I wanted to get a, a grip on this and understand what it was. I also wanted to better understand what the place of capitalism was in this system. Uh, and I, I was never really um, convinced uh, by, um, and I know I'm, I'm, I'm being a little bit crude and broad brush with this, but I was never really convinced by the, the Marxist position, which really had capital as the, uh, the larger force and the state as sort of its handmaiden or its executive committee, you know, depending on which writer you were, you were uh, reading. Uh, and so I wanted to understand what the place of capital was in the system too. And uh, what that really took me to was, you know, a search for, for paradigms, uh, for some kind of easier, uh, easy but not inaccurate way to understand this. And it, I, it occurred to me that, uh, that there is one element of the state today um, that uh, really is a kind of a paradigm for the whole thing, and that is the computer operating system. Um, and that gets back to, I think, what Kropotkin said, which is that uh, in, in my sort of framing of it, it is that um, the state is not just uh, government. It's not just a set of institutions that government runs. The state is, um, a, uh, is, is really a kind of an all-encompassing environment uh, that is created for us, that molds us, uh, and that, that attempts to sort of on a certain level, fool us into thinking that, that that is what there is, not society, not us as individuals, as a group, but this larger thing. So, uh, you know, to give an example is that uh, uh, we assume that we need government. We assume that we need leaders. We assume that we need entrepreneurs to start businesses. We, need, we assume that we need uh, cultural institutions like churches, we need the cultural institutions like um, uh, nonprofits to do things government doesn't want to do. But this is a system that we bought into or that we've been persuaded from birth is what there is. And, uh, the, and as I look back, for, there's two things. First of all, as I look back, um, I looked a little historically past the state uh, and I realized that up until the time that, that the modern state in Europe started to sort of congeal, there was a dazzling array of different forms of human organization. 
uh, that people could almost literally pick and choose from, from communes to kingdoms to baronies to uh, rural cooperatives to, uh, to um, uh, merchant cities to uh, uh, religious um, uh, uh, brotherhoods or sisterhoods or all sorts of ways to organize human society. They've all been sort of blended down into one. Uh, elements of them have been co-opted, taken over, uh, so that eventually you get just this one structure that we have today. Um, you know, you look back 100 years ago even, and there were vast parts of the world that didn't run this way, that still had many, many multifarious ways to organize themselves. And we're now at the point where literally that's disappearing. We're at the point where we could, we're, uh, the people who are more or less, for lack of a better word, the elite in the world are very close to creating a kind of a, uh, of a monoculture uh, of government and of uh, economy and of, uh, of culture, like a, a single way to do things. That's what uh, neoliberalism and corporate globalization are, are all about ultimately, is to create a kind of a, a monoculture that covers the whole world. And uh, that's what that's where we get back to the anarchist critique because I think that the that the uh, one of the big uh, contributions that anarchism makes that's unique in terms of discussing what's going on in the world is that it's the only uh, if you want to call it an ideology or you know set of possible ideologies anarchism is the only one that actually does not take the state for granted as a sort of a given in our lives. The state, does, we don't have to have the state. And so if that's the case, we can critique it. We can, we can look at it as something we might potentially reject. Uh, and that's, I, I'm, I'm hoping that, that uh, my book will have some appeal to people who aren't anarchists, who simply want to have a fresh point of view on this and to, and to be able to step back and look at the state on its merits rather than simply assume that it's what we have, it's what we have to have. Because I think that that's the first step in a very necessary um, uh, migration away from it that we have to make, and we can talk a little more about what that might what that might look at like that might look like what it would involve. But I think the the first thing is we need to sort of say what is this thing, uh, what's wrong with it, to what extent is it responsible for uh, for problems that we tend to. Um, uh, ascribe to you know more specific things like capital, like uh, um, you know uh, technology that's out of control, uh, it's, uh, greed, etc. All of these things fit in, but we we can understand them a lot better if we first understand the state. Uh, so that's that's a long way of saying that I hope that the book um, uh, becomes a kind of a conversation starter on a lot of these topics. Uh, I'm not the last word. Uh, I'm st it's, a, it's a topic I'm still working on. And I'm gonna be writing about more and more um, over the, you know, the next however many years. But I, I, I want other people to collaborate on it. I want this to be something that we can all talk about now. And uh, so that's, that's my hope for the book. And, uh, and, and it's what I hope people can take out of this conversation. So that's, uh, those are the basics. Awesome, thanks for giving us a, an intro. Um, Maya, I wanna go ahead and bring you into the conversation now. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if there are any threads that you wanna pick up on um, or share? Uh, well, I guess one thing that I had been thinking about a lot because this is, I'm always thinking about this and Eric had all, also asked me to think about this is, is colonialism and its relationship to the state. So I guess I, I would like to um, bring that in a little bit and I think it's, we can see this really clearly in the case of what Israel is doing right now. And um, when I think about this, I think it's that the colonial state, as I understand it, is in certain ways the purest form of this state that we're trying to break down and analyze. And 
in a couple of ways, like, so for example, some of the key elements of like classical definitions of the state involve monopoly of the legitimate use of force and violence, monopoly of the legitimate um, claim. And of course, legitimate here is like self-defined by the state too. So legitimate is something that I wanna, I'm not taking for granted either, but it claims the legitimate monopoly on the use of force and the legitimate monopoly on the right to collect surplus to concentrate wealth into itself. And I think that's true in both um, pre-modern and modern forms of colonialism and pre-modern and modern forms of the state. And the collection, the exertion of force, like in its raw unmasked form and the collection of wealth, the extraction of wealth in its raw unmasked form, um, underlaid by a racial ideology that kind of justifies that, that's like pure to see in a colonial situation. And it's also true you know, in the metropole, in the state, in the nation state itself, that it, in, in it's not named as colonial state, but it's, it's equally true there, it's just more masked. And, um, and I think it kind of like, it, it's a chicken egg thing too, because the state as it formed, both again, pre-modern and modern, always required empire and colonialism in order to operate. So whether it means say contiguously like territorial expansion, military fiscalism, that's like, we need more resources, we need more space, we need more extracted wealth, and we need to exert more force and coercion to keep extracting that wealth and controlling that territory. So expansion in a contiguous territory, and then the same thing overseas, we need resources, we need markets, we need strategic advantage. Like kind of playing and winning in an interstate system. And this always exists in an interstate system, not just in isolation, kind of like um, requires playing a game of empire and colonialism. And then examples of modern colonialism were the laboratory for the institutions and the practices of the state. So this was true, say in the British empire, they worked out in their empire, especially in India, um, methods of policing. And this all comes from counterinsurgency. The logic of counterinsurgency in a colonial state leads to policing, surveillance, all the disciplinary carceral techniques that get brought back into the home area. And the same way with the US state, it developed the militarized border, became the place where it worked out its racial logic and, and this was taken care of at home too. And so kind of like the people that talked about fascism and the fascist state, like Hannah Arendt was like, oh, this is colonialism brought back into Europe. And then M. M. Césaire is like, well, duh. He kind of flipped that over and he's like, well, duh, you know, you're all freaked out about fascism. People that have been colonized have known exactly this face of the state for hundreds of years already. So like, I really think that kind of the logic of colonialism and the logic of the state are, are two sides, two faces of the, of the same thing. So, um, yeah, I just, I always think of them in tandem with each other. And I think as we're critiquing the state as we see it today, um, whether we're talking about militarized policing inside the United States, particularly um, in its intensively racialized aspect, that's part of a colonial border, you know, expansion logic. Um, whether we're talking about Israel's behavior, its, its attacks on Palestine now and since its founding, all of the kind of like, egregious examples we see of state behavior, whether that has to do with racial capitalism or militaristic activity, I think has to be, you know, colonialism and empire are part of the functioning of the state. So those are my own kind of preoccupations, but um, yeah, I figured because that, that's been part of the, the conversations that we've had, I, I wanted to throw that in there too. And I guess another, let me just throw this into kind of like um, Liberty, Eric and I were sort of talking leading up to this kind of figuring out where we'd focus our thoughts and um, one or both of you had mentioned um, state formation, ideas of state formation and you know, Peter Gelder Lewis's writings on that. And we were talking about the idea that the state isn't something that's just kind of this, ascent yeah. <laughs> It doesn't just exist out there in a complete finished form as a one-time thing that was made and now we live with it. It's something that has to be reproduced and made and practiced and enacted constantly. And that happens on the border. That happens every time we interface with the law or with the police or um, any kind of way that, yeah, it has to be continually remade. And the same with the situation of colonization. It wasn't this one-time event. It's something that has to be continually 
reproduced and remade and practiced always. And so maybe that's a hint for us as can we imagine outside of it? Can we imagine a way to resist it or a reality outside of it? It's like, if this is something that's not just there, but is being made every single day, um, what would we do differently every single day? If it's in process every single day? Yeah, I, I, would, I would add to that. I'm getting a little bit of feedback. feedback. Um, um, let me try and ignore it. I, I, I think there's, there's, a, there's a, uh, a, a kind of a strand of thinking now that I think is very important in terms of what Maya said, which is that actually in terms of, uh, of, of British India, uh, for a long time, British India was, was kind of a laboratory for techniques of governance in, in Britain itself, in the metropole, uh, that, that things were tried out in terms of policing. Uh, there was a police force in, in India, apparently, before there was one in the UK. Uh, and that, it, that, that, that the, the politics of the colony and the politics of the, you know, of the, of the quote unquote mother country were, very, were always very tightly uh, bound together. And that's because as, as Maya said, uh, really uh, colonialism and imperialism and those types of exploitation are something that go right back to the beginning of the state almost as soon as you had coherent uni European states. And again, uh, the state is and remains, uh, according to my argument, a European phenomenon. It's possibly the most successful export Europe ever invented because it's exported it all over the world and imposed it and uh, induced other peoples to adopt it all over the world. But it's, it remains essentially a European invention. Uh, and, that, and that as soon as you started to have coherent states like England, France, Spain, in the late Middle Ages, they started to pursue colonialism. Uh, you know, literally, uh, and, and, and every state tried to do this, literally Sweden, Denmark, and Latvia had colonies in the Caribbean in the, in the uh, 16th, 17th century. Everybody tried to do it. Uh, even before that, Italian city-states had colonies in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, colonialism is, and, and they were kind of the laboratory of the modern state. So, uh, uh, the, the colonialism and the state have always been bound together. Now, why is this the case? Uh, well, one reason, I think it goes back to what, what I, th I think is the kind of economic engine of this whole thing, is that states really uh, began to cultivate capital and cultivate that form of uh, economic organization as a way to, uh, to um, build the resources that would enable them to uh, deepen their control within their territories and then to expand their control outside of their territories. And as Maya said, that inevitably led them to want to conquer resources in other places. Uh, so, and, and, and that's really where this tight connection between the state and capital comes from is you can't have one without the other. Uh, without the state, capital would be resisted. It would be, uh, it would go out of control. It would become too exploitative. And uh, it, it would, it would uh, and, and not only that, but it would uh, begin to overstep its abilities as it, as it often does. Uh, it needs the state to bail it out, frankly, uh, every now and then. In fact, at increasing intervals in, in our own time. Uh, at the same time, this, the, the, cap, the state can't do without capital because without capital, it can't continue this constant cycle of relentless economic growth that it needs to extend its power. Uh, and again, that inevitably leads to colonialism. It leads to uh, slaveocracies. Uh, it leads to economic exploitation in parts of the world that it, it didn't really have a foothold in before. And that's essentially what generates it. And again, it, it's right from the beginning. Uh, I think uh, today, it, it hasn't stopped either. Today, we have disguised versions of colonialism of the kind that uh, uh, France and the United States to some extent practice in Africa, for example. Uh, we have uh, colonialism in the case of uh, the policies that China follows in Tibet and Xinjiang, uh, for example. We have, there's many sort of disguised versions of it today, but it's really to a large extent the same thing. So um, I, I'm just saying this to kind of reinforce this close connection, which I think there is. Uh, uh, you cannot, in a way, you cannot have you 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 cannot have the state without 
some form of colonialism or imperialism. Yeah, and just to follow up on a couple examples um, that Eric mentioned. So Eric mentioned what the British Empire did in India and then carried it, carrying that back to policing inside the UK. So they're using tactics in colonial India, which they then used in the just the, you know, the Metropolitan Police, which they then used in Ireland. Um, up until like, you know, the troubles, they're still using, they're, they're exchanging, they're like, sometimes people are going from one area to the other saying, here are the techniques and the weapons that we used over here, we think this could work over here too. And I'm thinking of another contemporary example of this, again, think about what's going on in Israel. Um, the Israeli military and the NYPD have had exchange programs to teach, to teach each other tactics. So the militarization of police in the United States and contemporary, you know, imperial warfare are always learning from each other. The use of drones is another one, for example. And yeah, the growth of colonialism, the British East India Company was a, a trading corporation. It was a for-profit trading corporation, which is how the British Empire got built, which is how the state got built. The Royal African Company. I've been leading, so I'm talking to you here from Lenape Hoking, aka New York. And I've been recently leading some like radical history tours here in the city. And like New York got named New York because the British took over New Amsterdam from the Dutch Empire, named it after the Duke of York, who was the head of the Royal Africa Company, which was the biggest slave trading corporation in the Atlantic. And he wanted to use the city as a major slave port. And that's how he wanted to build you know, capital accumulation that became Wall Street. So the capitalism, imperialism, you know, white supremacy, the modern state are like all <laughs> I can see on my Zoom, like like that. <laughs> yeah, that's that's goes to a I think a basic definitional point too, which is that, uh, and I, I hope this doesn't become confusing for people who read my book. I don't I don't think it is, but I, I make a distinction between the state with a capital S and the state with a small S. Uh, the state with a small S could be a state like the United States, like. Uh, uh, India or like Australia. Um, the state with a capital S is something bigger. That's the bigger phenomenon that all of those states are part of, which is this, uh, again, this attempt to sort of uh, uh, remold or recast the world in this kind of simulacrum uh, of a society. Uh, it's something global. Uh, it's something that uh, is extended everywhere in places that it, that it, that it frankly doesn't fit even. Uh, but it's but it happens everywhere, and so really, what we're talking about here is the state with a capital S, and that's the system that Maya is talking about was an attempt to take something that includes that includes the state, it includes capital, the state with a small S, it includes capital, it includes slave trading, it includes all of these things, and to essentially uh, uh, put them all together in one big unit that equals economic growth. And there, that's where the Duke of York comes in. That's where uh, New, New Amsterdam and then New York come in uh, and, uh, and, and, and many other places that you could sort of uh, look at as comparable. Um, the state is something that, you know, uh, one of my favorite anarchist thinkers, Gustav Landauer, liked to say that the state is a, uh, this isn't exact, an exact quote, but the state is a, a kind of a, a state of mind that we have, that we, that we allow ourselves to uh, to uh, adopt and uh, operate under, and I don't. I think I don't think that's the whole story, but that is a big part of it because that's what the state wants us to uh, accept. And if I can, for a second, I want to get back to the idea of an operating system just to kind of explain why that works here, uh, because I think that what uh, a system like Mac. Uh, uh, win, like Windows or Mac iOS have in common with the state is that they're an attempt to create an environment that essentially does everything for us. It gives us ways to do all the things that we want to do. Uh, anytime, there's, there's a constant sort of drive to take anything we do in our social lives, in our cultural or economic lives, and, and, and find an equivalent in a computer operating system. So that essentially we... Um, uh, we are uh, living this kind of virtual life in every part of our in every part of our lives, and that's essentially what the state tries to do. And I think that um, one way we can look at computer systems, I think, is informed by this as well, because uh, essentially uh, two things: is that first of all, uh, 
operating systems and computer systems in general are not something that was born out of somebody's mind. In a lot of cases, uh, they were born out of a desire uh, on the part of government or the military to have certain ways to communicate uh, and to, um, uh, to calculate and to make decisions. And uh, that's where they came from. So it, it makes a lot of sense that an operating system essentially would be inspired by the state itself to some extent, or it would, it would, it would take on some of the aspects of this. Um, you know, one of the, uh, there's a, something, somebody suggested to me recently that what I'm describing in a way, and I resisted this for a while, but I'm a little more comfortable with it now, is that what I'm describing in a way is something like the Truman Show. You know, if you ever saw that movie, it's the guy who's literally living in, a, in an artificial reality. He's living on a stage set that was built for him and people watch him on TV. And he goes about a life which he thinks is a normal, real life, but it's actually not. And that on some level is what the state does for us. And, it's, and on a certain level, it's what uh, uh, designers who work at uh, Microsoft or at Apple or any no other set of companies are trying to do as well. They want to find some kind of, a, they want to create something virtual that we can live as part of and operate as part of. And one reason is because A, it makes us more efficient. They're trying to put us into something that makes us more efficient, something that allows them to quantify what we do, the value we create and so forth. And it's easier in a system like this. And that feeds into uh, trying to accomplish as well. So without getting too conspiratorial, um, I, 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 uh, I, I think that Maya is right on with sort of uh, describing this as a sort of like this, you know, it's. It's all together, and our job really is to sort of figure out how all those pieces fit, and 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 how they and and how they work towards a sort of a, a more or less unified goal. So, hearing you talk about the state, um, I guess one one question I have is sort of this question of what is inside and what is outside of the logic of the state, you know, of of the operating system. Um, and, you know, one thing that like jumped out at me in, in reading the book um, was the assertion that um, really a, an incredible amount of what is around us is, is kind of an extension of the state logic. Uh, and, and you named specifically a couple of times um, that even criminal activity might be properly understood as part of the logic of the state. And you named like drug cartels and gangs. Right. Um, and I guess that was surprising to me because I think we often think about those as uh, you know, obviously oppositional to the established order, and it, it makes me wonder, um, you know, if if a drug cartel or a gang isn't outside the state, who is outside the state? Like, can we get outside of the state, or are we just hopelessly stuck in it? Well, I think that I think that it's to, to make it even more complicated. Is is I think that there's there's a lot of ways in which some of the things we do are inside of the state and outside at the same time. Um, if you are a midwife, you are doing an activity that uh, is community-based, I think in a kind of a fundamental way that has a mutual aid aspect to it, uh, that is holistic as opposed to specialized uh, because it connects up with so many other things involving health and so forth. Um, that arguably is outside the state, but <clears throat> when you are funded by the state, when you are regulated by the state, when you are um, restricted in terms of your ability to compete with MDs or other people who uh, are practic medical practitioners, you are being shoehorned into a state system. And so you kind of have to look at the activity and then you have to look at the way it fits, it's, it's made to fit into the legal or uh, political or uh, social structure or economic structure. Um, and so <clears throat> we can do things that a lot of things that are that are very healthy and that build societies, but at the same time we're required to do it within this framework. Uh, so I don't know. I, I, I guess my answer to your question is it's not simple, uh, but we have to um, we have to figure out a way to do the things that we know need to be done uh, that build community um, as much outside that system as we can. And that's difficult and it is kludgy because the state makes it easy for us in a lot of ways. It, it, it gives us a clear path. It gives us a, an easy way to think about it. And we have to sort of 
uh, you know, uh, run the risk of, of reinventing the wheel on some, uh, on some level in terms of building a system outside the state that doesn't depend on it. So that's, that's the challenge, I think. Yeah, that reminds me, I, I, I thought several times while reading the book um, about uh, um, Victoria Law and Maya Shinoir's recent excellent work um, uh, on abol like kind of uh, on alternatives to uh, carceral systems. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that they really tackle uh, is kind of this question of, can we just uh, take all of the function of policing and move it to some other branch of the state, right? Can we just get, uh, you know, social workers to essentially do all the, the, the surveilling and controlling and managing of, you know, populations that are, it's currently done by the police, but we'll just hand it over to a different branch of the state. And I think what they really compellingly show um, uh, with their work is that uh, actually um, that, that, doesn't result in a reduction in harm, um, and that those systems can be just as brutal um, and uh, and racist um, as as policing itself. Uh, so, you know, I, I felt like that's a maybe a concrete example of the way that you know you're talking about. Um, if we if we don't find a way to actually question the underlying logic itself, but we simply attempt to move from one institution to another, we kind of stay trapped within the same system. Yeah, I, I would just add one thing to that, which is that um, uh, uh, carceral systems and uh, um, harm reduction systems are something that I think are really important for us to look at and to cultivate as, as, as sort of like nodes of resistance and nodes of um, uh, a new kind of society. Uh, but one thing I've, I've, I have um, uh, observed is like, for example, with First Nations in Canada, which have, have tried to have sentencing circles and justice systems built, or, built around their traditions rather than around the um, institutions that the Canadian state gives them is that it works a lot better when people don't think they can fall back on the state. In other words, it's okay, we will do a sentencing circle and but then if somebody doesn't like the result, they can go run off to the local courthouse and say, hey, uh, I need you to adjudicate this or run off to the police and say, I need you to take care of this for me. And so there's a kind of a, it, it's, that's, that's the challenge for us is to, uh, is to not just set up institutions that are outside the state, but to, to do something about our, expe our own expectations, you know, that, that the state is always out there somewhere for us. We need to sort of free ourselves of this idea that the state is, uh, is a fallback or is the ultimate reality that we can always lean on. You know, and that's complicated. That's a that's something. That's where I, I think you know social revolution is is something we need to sort of take as a serious idea now, uh, even before political revolution. And maybe piggybacking on that a little bit, and also responding to what Liberty was saying, um, maybe part of that social revolution could be that Liberty was suggesting it's not really an improvement if you move state policing functions into state backed welfare functions that are also quite disciplinary but what if they what if you what if that could be preempted by you know like the huge number of you know people that end up in the carceral system really it's about mental health or it's about lack of access to fair housing or it's about you know drug problems or all these other things which what if what if there were sort of peer led community based mutual aid based cooperative um you know, structures in place that would be able to address those things. You wouldn't need to call a state-backed body to do those things if a community could say, here's a person that needs help, let's help them. Or a community that would be run in such a way um, from the bottom up that it wouldn't even get to those crisis points. It would be more of a holistic preventative type of thing that would not lead to that point of where it becomes a policing issue or even another kind of state-backed issue. So I'm just kind of like, it's not something I've really you know, articulated, I'm, I'm not like saying, oh, here, I have a theory of how this would work, but just kind of following up on both of your, both of your thoughts. Well, that, that of course is, is a very anarchist answer, which is great because <laughs> what you're saying is 
we're not here to prescribe the way to do this. We're here to say, let's, let's all go out and try and think of how we do this. I mean, uh, we're, we're, we're not proposing another system to slap on top of the one that we don't like. You know, that's, that's, that's uh, presumably what we're trying to do. Um, and uh, I, would, I would just add that um, as far as uh, the kind of things we're talking about here, uh, it's, it's important to bear in mind that that's in a way the state's whole mission is to foreclose these kinds of opportunities and to convince us that they are not there for us that, uh, or to absorb it and co-opt it. Um, that's, that's really the, and, 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 and pull it into the state in some fashion. That's, that's what it's there to do. And so if we find it difficult to articulate or to, dis, or to figure out how do we do, how do we, uh, how do we do mental health outside of the state or outside of and without the resources of the state? That's for a reason. I mean, that's that's they, that's that's because that's how they that's how they work twenty four seven to set it up for us. So that's our again, that's our challenge. So I want to circle back to um, some pieces from earlier when we were um, discussing kind of the evolutionary history of the state and it's like integral connection to colonialism. Um, you know, another thing I think that really stands out when you look at this history, um, and Eric, you sort of argue that the modern state really has, I think about a 500 year history, maybe a little more, yeah. um, so that it is a, a relatively modern phenomena. Um, you know, it's, it seems really notable that that, uh, that parallels um, uh, kind of the development of anti-blackness um, right. as really a hallmark of um, certainly uh, the United States, um, but really states throughout the world. Um, you know, I, I, I think something that has really come up for a lot of people uh, over the last year or two, or for some of us for much longer, is the fact that it, it really feels like um, the state is unable to stop um, perpetuating anti-blackness and that like harm to black people and black communities is actually, it's almost like something that the state doesn't seem to be able to turn off even when it would be good seemingly like, like it would probably be good if the police didn't kill any black people for like a few months, right? Like when people are burning precincts. Um, and, and yet the state seems unable to do that. Um, and I guess I'm curious uh, about that relationship between um, the development of the state form and anti-blackness, uh, and and of course, you know, clearly there's uh, there's a need to to organize around an in group and an out group, um, and I guess I'm curious to hear more about that and and what is it uniquely about white supremacy and the state form uh, that seems to tie them so closely together? Right, right. Uh, shall I go first? <laughs> I know we okay. both got a lot of ideas about this. Um, I, I think that, well, it's complicated, of course, but one idea that I try to develop in my book is, uh, is this idea, and I give it a rather clunky uh, name, is the core identity group. And the core identity group is uh, something that every state has. And it's essentially a, um, uh, a defined group of people who are uh, essentially, they're the people who the elite of the state are drawn from, and by the state, I mean capital, I mean government, I mean all of these institutions. Uh, it's, it's the sort of population, the group that they're drawn from. It's also sort of the favored population group. They're the ones that have the most, the, the deepest uh, loyalty to the state. Uh, and this is something you see, especially when in the period where nationalism becomes big in terms of the development of the state, let's say in the 18th or the 19th and 20th century. So for example, in, in the United States, uh, whatever progress it's happened to make, the reality is that the core identity group is uh, white people of European descent. That is the core identity group in this country. They're the favored group. They are the people who feel that the state and the nation belong to them. Uh, they feel like uh, any other group on some level is an interloper and they expect to be the group that the leadership comes from. Okay, you can look at uh, just about any other state, certainly any large state in the world, and uh, there's a similar core identity group. Uh, in Germany, it would be Germans. In 
uh, Russia, it would be Russians. In China, it's uh, the, uh, the Han Chinese as opposed to Tibetans or Uyghurs or some other minority or uh, ethnic uh, group. Um, and uh, there's a kind of, in other words, even, even in the developing world, there's a, sort of a, an attempt to, uh, to define their own, uh, 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 once they become independent and imperial to some extent, there's, an, there's an, uh, a tendency to kind of define their own form of whiteness. That's one of the things that they've imported from Europe is this idea that there is a core identity group and the core identity group is important because they're they're the, the basis for the for the state's legitimacy. They're the basis for this. They're the most loyal. They're the most willing to sacrifice. They are the uh, the the most entitled group, and they are they uh, essentially are again the sort of the root of the state's legitimacy. They're the basis of it, uh, and that's why there is so much concern in the United States, for example, uh, about alienating uh, the base, the Republican base. There's a kind of an idea, I think that even people on the relative left of the Democratic Party have that you can't offend these people too much. If you do, you are undermining something. That you have to let them, you have to let them blow off steam. You have to let them uh, 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 practice a certain amount of abuse of minorities. You have to convince them that they still have a stake. Otherwise, there will be problems. And uh, that is, I think, the root of the kind of entitlement that white people feel, at least in this country, uh, is that we have permission because we are the core identity group. Uh, whether that's stated in the law or not, that is the way it is regarded. Um, and as the world has become more multicultural, as states all over the world have become more multicultural, this has become more and more of a problem. And that's one of the tensions, I think, that in the modern state today, that, uh, that makes it, um, uh, for us anyway, a less viable and a less tolerable kind of um, institution. The fact that it's, it's, it is, is be, it's settled into this kind of hostility towards any group other than the core identity group. Um, and I think, so I think that's, that's the, the tight connection between the state and racism uh, is there. But uh, that's just, uh, let's just say that's just one observation uh, um, coming out of my research at this point. I think that's really well said, Eric. I, I think that's right. And I, I, I don't know, as I've been thinking about this today, <laughs> I actually don't think the state as the, the capital S state, the kind of like categorical definition of the state is defined specifically by white supremacy and anti-blackness. I think it is defined by some kind of supremacy, by some kind of core identity group. And I, but I don't think that that determines which groups get put into that slot of who's in, who's out, who's on top, who's on the bottom. Um, I think ours, this particular one, the particular history that we do have here is very much obviously, I hope obviously, bound up with white supremacy and anti-blackness. But I don't think that's universally the definition of the state. I think that's our specific history. And um, it has to be dismantled it, you know, in our specific history because that is our specific history that absolutely specifically has to be dismantled in order to um, intervene in that operating system. But I think it's possible to imagine other um, instantiations of a state form that use, you know, that could plug in other groups into that, that model. Right. I mean, that's that's true. I, 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 you're absolutely right about that. I mean, you can look at the uh, the example of Switzerland, where you have four major language groups that have fought each other fairly savagely at different times in history, and uh, 150 years or odd or uh, or more years ago, more or less figured out a way to live with each other, uh, and uh, but struggled for hundreds of years to do it, and they finally did come up with a kind of a modus vivendi. Uh, so that is doable uh, within the state, but it, but, but it requires a kind of a subtle redefinition over time of who the core identity group is. Uh, the state is capable of, 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 ad of uh, uh, adapting in that way, uh, but 
there's always, but I think there's a flip side to it as well, which is that if you're going to have uh, a legitimacy based around a core identity group, there has to be an other. Yeah. There has to be an outsider. There has to be somebody or some group who uh, you define yourself against. And that's an issue. Uh, you know, there, there has to be the immigrant. Uh, in the, at this point in the United States, it's immigrants are the group that we, uh, that we are suspicious of that are uh, um, undermining us in some way. And you look at any other state, you know, there is, there is, there is also a group like this. And, and to, for all that, you know, the state tells us that uh, these people are our problem, the state needs them there uh, for, so, that, so that the core identity group can continue to have somebody to define itself against. And that's why we have this perpetuation of racism. That's why it, it never seems to go away. Or if, it, or if it goes away against one group, it shifts to another. Uh, it's just, it's simply part of the way that the state um, uh, organizes legitimacy for itself. Yeah, there has to be, there has to be a group that is defined as legitimate to uh, enslave, exploit, or exterminate. And so this, Eric, what do you, this raises a big question then it seems like if it's not only like, oh, we'll be fine if we address, say, the coercive forms of the state, but it really seems like that's not going to be conquerable or resistible or replaceable unless we address this kind of thought form of someone has to be, I don't want, I, and, I'm, and I'm like, I was, hesitate to use the term dehumanized because I also want to kind of shift away, you know, thinking of humans as one being in an interrelated ecosystem too. Right. Um, yeah. But like, you know, some, how do we intervene in that entire structure of thought that there is someone, some type of beings who are okay to exploit, kill? Right. I mean, we can, we get a certain, you know, a uh, hundred years ago, the labor movement got a certain part of the distance there by uh, asserting, you know, hey, you people in the core identity group, you white working class people, you're being exploited too. And uh, building on that, um, the problem is that uh, that is, I, I think that that only goes part of the way. Um, if you that that uh, and, and I, I make an argument that in this country, for example, I think the labor movement has been undermined. Uh, it, it's, it's that racism is kind of like the glass ceiling in a way that the labor movement can has not been able to penetrate. That if it can't get past its own racism, it's never going to truly succeed. Uh, so yeah, there's a there's a sort of a catch twenty two um, element to it. Uh, I you know. Um, I think that there's ways of getting around this, but within the state, the state's always going to uh, have to create another, another other somehow. That's 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 its its mo. Or maybe maybe another another way to ask a question related to this too is is like, how do we? And again, I'm sort of piggybacking on your thoughts here. Um, how do we if if the white cis male working class or a previous elite class is now freaking out when they start to feel their privilege um, eroding or their supremacy being challenged or their dominance being challenged or their, they, they feel their own precarity. They feel economic collapse as a threat. They feel perhaps ecological collapse as a threat. How do how is it that they could see themselves as in solidarity with the, all the other people who have long been living precariously and under threat? Um, and it, that's not new to all these other people, that privileged group, it's new to them. It's not new to everybody else. How do they suddenly see like, oh yeah, we have it like, you know, we're all in this together rather than digging in and feeling that um, scarcity and that competition with everybody else and scapegoating everybody else, because that's, it, you know, if they could abandon that sense of themselves as as uniquely privileged and be in solidarity with everybody else, I mean, that seems like part of this hurdle too. Of course, of course, yeah. The, and 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 what the state does is it that's how that's when the state starts to rely on uh, cultural dog whistles and cultural appeals. Uh, someone like Donald Trump comes along miraculously just when just at the time when <laughs> Bernie Sanders is running for the president. Uh, voila, you get Donald Trump saying, 
hey, don't worry, I'm going to solve all your economic problems for you, Mr. White person, Mr. Cis White person, and uh, I am going to, uh, and, 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 and you deserve it more. Let's just face it, you deserve it more. And, and, and so that argument arises, and, and that sort of uh, avoids that particular danger, which is that the, uh, the white working class sort of starts to realize that its interests have, it has more interests in common with working people of, 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 of other ethnic groups. Um, uh, I don't mean to be pessimistic. I mean, there, there are ways for us to get around this. I, I'm just, you know, my job with this book was to kind of understand how the, how the state negotiates these things. And so that's, that's what I'm, you know, what I'm pointing out here. Uh, but uh, not to be pessimistic. Well, on the on the subject of not being pessimistic, I'm uh, I'm curious if y'all would be willing to share um, some sources of inspiration, uh, or if there are contemporary or historic models uh, for um, kind of resistance to the state and operating outside of the state. Maya, any thoughts for <laughs> first? <laughs> I got a couple ideas, but yeah, you go you go ahead, Eric. All right. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll tell you that, I mean, frankly, the, the most powerful example I can find right now is Black Lives Matter. And I'll tell you one, one very good reason is because the movement for Black Lives um, does not back political candidates. And when I saw that they weren't doing that, I thought, my God, this is what I've been waiting for. Because there, there, there's really an effort to say this is about the struggle, which is, means this is about, the, about us, the people rather than being about seizing political power or finding a way to shoehorn ourselves into the political system. That, that it's essential that uh, insurrections and insurgencies and struggles in the future do not uh, uh, build their power outside of, outside of the state. That's something we can do. Um, I mean, anytime we go into the street spontaneously without uh, a, uh, an NGO backing us uh, without uh, uh, being tacitly uh, aiming at attracting attention from politicians, we're um, we're beginning to do we're doing something that not only addresses an issue but builds uh, a different kind of society. So Black Lives Matter, I find incredibly inspirational. Um, I think that. Uh, just uh, Liberty, what you were talking about, you were, you were uh, mentioning just the beginning is this, uh, I think maybe historic general strike uh, by the Palestinians. Uh, that's another thing because like I say, um, a general strike by definition is a challenge to the, the whole system. It's a challenge to the state with a capital S. Uh, it's something that can't be contained within the, within the system that the state sets up. And so I think that that's a that's a a clear that should be a clear inspiration to uh, to people who are uh, uh, um, struggling with racism and economic uh, deprivation anywhere is it to start to look at it that way. And I guess just kind of looking around um, the world at di different recent examples of people really putting into practice non-state models of sovereignty, governance, collective organization. I mean, maybe this is cliche to mention like Chiapas, Rojava, various indigenous movements in the US and Canada who are re really developing non-state based practices of self-determination and sovereignty. And I don't think any of this is perfect or finished, but like it's, there are other models of organizing communities that do exist and have been in practice. And it's, it's pretty common to say like, oh, but those never work. Those always just kind of collapse. And it's like, it's not because of their own intrinsic nature that they often collapse. It's because they're usually attacked <laughs> um, very, uh, very fiercely from outside. Yeah, the pressure, the pressure they're under is tremendous. But yeah, yeah, the creativity you see is, I mean, is, is always amazing. Um, I think that, that another place to look is, the, uh, is in, in the post-war world was the uh, uh, peasant organizing, uh, campesino organizing throughout Latin America, which was crushed by the United States and its, its allies in, in Latin American governments in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But if you look at the organization that happened, 
and what was accomplished and the models that were created is tremendous. We're talking throughout Latin America. Uh, the, the Zapatistas were just simply the, in, in a way, the, the, the latest manifestation of something that has been developed over decades. The Morales government in Bolivia um, benefited directly from the organization, from uh, really uh, indigenous organization, um, not just of coca farmers, but, but all the people in those areas. Uh, using methods of organization which went back centuries. And um, that's where we can see, you know, one of the arguments I try and make in the book is that uh, uh, is that the developing world in a way is the, is, has been a greater laboratory than the developed world because in the developing world, you still have pockets of people who haven't uh, completely been absorbed into the state, into the way the state operates. And there's a creativity there and there's, some, there's a, a willingness for a, uh, a, a response, which is to take our experience and build our own kind of modernity off of it, uh, rather than simply accepting a kind of modernity that's handed to us by the state uh, and, and, and frankly, by uh, uh, people who don't understand our culture. And so we, we uh, you know, in a place like the United States, we have to sort of, we have to be curious. We have to look at what's being done elsewhere and, and not just think that, and not just automatically think that, you know, well, you know, uh, uh, it can't happen here uh, because we can make it happen here. I certainly hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think we're gonna pivot to taking some questions um, from participants. Uh, and so folks who have tuned in, please um, share your thoughts. Uh, it doesn't have to be in a question form. It's, it's the Q&A tool, but you can, you can share your, your, um, your perspective as well as your questions. Uh, and we did um, have a question here from Greg, uh, who is asking about the relationship between corporations and the state. Um, and I, I think, uh, Eric, you touched on this a little bit previously, talking about the dependency of capitalism and the state. On, on each other, but um, I'm wondering uh, if we might uh, say a little bit more about the extent to which um, uh, you know, challenging corporate power is part of the dismantling of the state. And is there some danger that uh, as the state is sort of beaten back, it becomes replaced by, I don't know, I guess there's like the sort of uh, cyberpunk dystopian vision of the future in which the state is atrophied and instead we have these like global megacorps that, that functionally are governance bodies, um, but fully privatized. Right. Uh, yeah, I guess, yeah, can you, can you speak a little bit to, to that relationship? Yeah, I, well, first of all, the, the, uh, that, that particular dystopia is possible, I think. Um, that uh, one of the things that, that people on the right like to talk about is globalists, you know, the new world order and uh, that there is some kind of world government that is uh, that that the system is trying to impose on them, and I think that I I think there is a tiny grain of truth in that, and that's that's the mon the sort of global monoculture that I that I talk about in the book, uh, but that is that is a desire of um, uh, people who are educated in um, elite institutions all over the world and essentially have the same view of government, the same view of what. Uh, the economy is supposed to be, whether they uh, are in China or Taiwan or Paris or New York. Um, so there is, the, there is a tight connection there. Um, corporations, the, the way I kind of frame it, are they're not separate from the state. They're part of the state. Uh, and they're there to, as, as engines of economic growth, which the state needs to extend its power both deeper into the society and then further outward, um, because corporations are essentially geared to fast as economic growth as fast as it can possibly happen. Um, that's their that's their role. Um, you know, the the origin of the corporation as a legal entity was something that was licensed by the state or by government to do a specific thing, like build a bridge or build a railroad or, uh, or uh, operate a canal or some, some sort of useful thing. And I think on some level, it hasn't really changed that role. Uh, the corporation is there to do these things, only they don't tend to be as useful 
as they were back then. They tend to be more like um, uh, uh, extract every bit of cobalt from the earth so that we can create um, you know, uh, uh, more batteries and, and, and more of the things that we need to, to, to run computers or to, or to mine Bitcoin. You know, uh, it becomes that sort of thing, uh, which becomes very destructive. And so, uh, but, but the, the, the uh, through line is that the corporation is still there as part of this economic engine that the state uh, uh, gets moving and, and needs to survive. So there's a, a, a kind of a, there's a, a, a it, you know, you can think of the corporation as part of the state, or you can think of it as having a symbiotic relation to the state. Either one, I think it comes out to the same thing. Maya, do you have any thoughts that you want to share on yeah, that? I, I was trying to figure out what to, um, what to add to that. And I, I'm glad you said symbiotic because I was thinking that word too. I was going to add that in, particularly with the neoliberal state. They're extremely symbiotic and that has worked specifically through the state privatizes and corporatizes its functions, yeah. um, outsources its functions to, to private companies that are going to be maximally extractive and where the profit motive um, outweighs by far any other function. Any other function these things are doing is, is an excuse in order to be maximo, maximally extractive in profit making. And I think then what happens is it, it, it allows the state, that symbiosis allows the state to do the things it wants to do, use its force, extract its wealth, et cetera, um, without having to, because it's going through this kind of outsourced form, it doesn't have to be responsible to people's well-being and welfare, the common good, because it's supposed to be. It, it, its rhetoric says it's supposed to be, that it, it has a responsibility to its people, to its taxpayers, to its citizens. But once things are outsourced, the corporation doesn't have that responsibility. The corporation, you know, famously by definition, only has the responsibility to maximize returns to its shareholders, um, not any responsibility to the common good or the commonwealth. Um, so yeah, it lets the state do its thing without even having to pretend to care about people's well-being. So yeah, I think in, in the neoliberal state, it is one and the same. You can't get rid of one without the other. Um, but I don't really have any good answers for that either. Like, which do we tackle? How do we tackle it? What do we do instead? <laughs> Anyone listening who has ideas, um, please. yeah, let us all know. I would add just one thing, which is, you know, people get very hung up on the idea of privatization and... Uh, you know, what's, what's part of the private sector and what's part of the state sector. And I think that uh, really we need to sort of break down that, that definitional wall is that if you, are, uh, if you are working for a corporation that is extracting uh, fossil fuels, you are part of the state. Uh, if you are operating a, um, uh, a, uh, an Ivy League school, if you are the, the head of an Ivy League school, it's private, but it's part of the state too. It supplies leadership to the state. It does research for the state. They're very, very closely enmeshed. And, and so the same goes for corporations. If you, uh, if you try and separate them out, you start to lose the big picture of what uh, the, the larger system of the state does. You know, so I just, I just caution people in terms of drawing too, too rigid uh, uh, a defining line. Uh, there's lots of functions that have gone in and out of state control multiple times over history in terms of education, history of the state in terms of education and so forth. But there's always an element on which to, uh, in which it's set up to, to benefit the state or do the, what the state needs it to do. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting area where anarchism um, and anarchist thinkers seem to offer a lot that isn't present, at least in the United States, in other political discourses. Like we have this, um, extremely, uh, I, I don't know, uh, extremely basic understanding of like, like a political spectrum where you have kind of like on the left, you have the people that want to contain everything within the state. And then on the right, you have, I guess, people who favor like a free market unfettered by the state. And I think anarchists look at that and, and recognize on some level that it all collapses down into the same position. Um, and that in fact, like the idea of a free market has like never really existed, right? Like the market in which we live and operate is, you know, it's built by and characterized by um, 
continuous and violent intervention by the state uh, in order to maintain systems of privilege and power. Um, and, and, and I don't, yeah, I think it's just, I think it's really fascinating that that is, that's a piece of the equation that anarchist theorists really are able to, to, to kind of like expose. Um, and I think that the, the book does that well. I also, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of the work of Kevin Carson, who's written very extensively about um, the historical uh, role of the state in the development of capitalism. Um, and it's something that the left tends to miss somehow, despite the fact that it's so big and so crucial. And um, I, I guess it also points towards another question I have though, which is kind of um, what what is, right-wing anti-statism, right? Like when, when we think, when we talk about this idea that there's a right-wing in the United States that opposes government, um, what, what is that actually? Um, because it's clear that it's, it's quite different than what we're talking about tonight. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, that uh, the short answer is that right-wing uh, anti-statism is basically a bunch of uh, right-wing people trying to be cool. It's it's a way to it's a way to seem like well you know I don't believe in the state I uh, uh, you know I am I'm for liberty I'm for freedom and so forth uh, and and I don't trust the government it sounds cool it sounds very 60s you know which was the origin of a lot of right wing thinking and a lot of right wing cultural behavior just the way it was the origin of a lot of left wing cultural thinking and behavior uh, it sounds it sounds very cool you know. Um, the, the problem is that, first of all, an awful lot of people who define themselves as right-wing anti-state, when you actually get down to uh, specifics, it turns out that they're, they're anything but. Uh, they are very behind policing. They're very supportive of police. They're very supportive of um, repression against migrants. You know, ask, ask your average right-wing uh, anti-state person if they would be interested in uh, a more liberal border policy and see how far you get with them. Um, there's, there's a kind of, it's, it, in a way, it's a, it's a kind of a PR gambit more than anything else, I think. Um, because when you really come down to it, I think these are, these are people who are, in a lot of cases, quasi-fascists of a sort. Um, and, but, they, but they kind of, but they use this idea of being uh, you know, against um, the federal government or against uh, uh, anything above the level of a, sh of a county sheriff, they, they use it as a kind of a smokescreen. Or they're, or they've been, you know, um, they've been uh, taught to think that way. Yeah, I, I guess I think there's maybe, they're not all the same. All the kind of right-wing anti-statism, there's multiple things going on. And I think at least some of them, another thing in kind of our pre-talk um, discussions that we were sharing around, I think Liberty, you'd pointed to the distinction between the state, the government and the nation. And Eric, you talked about this too. Um, I think some of the right-wing groups that we were talking about as anti-state maybe are actually more anti-government. And the problem is that they think the government is controlled by the liberal elites, the globalists, what, you know, all of these people that they don't like, and they actually want a state that represents them. They want an authoritarian populism. They want, they want, they want the state for themselves, you know? Um, so I think they're more, some of them are more anti-government. I think there are some who maybe are more kind of purely and ideologically anti-state too, but the distinction between an anarchist or a left anti-statism might be that the state is only one of the forms of domination, hierarchy, authoritarianism that we oppose. I think that anarchists have a more comprehensive intersectional way of, um, analyzing, critiquing, and resisting domination, hierarchy, coercion, all of that. Yeah. So the state's a major one, but it's not the only one. So I think it is possible to be a right-wing anti-statist who nevertheless um, still is upholding settler colonialism, patriarchy, white supremacy, um, and, and, and they can be tricky because you, I like, you know, and however much of it is kind of like PR and however much of it is genuinely believed, you can read a certain extent and be like, yeah, this actually, like, I don't know if any of you have had the experience, like you get on some website and you're like, wait, is this, is this our people or is this someone else? And you get to a certain extent, it's like, it's like, okay, yeah, this is making sense. This is making sense. Oh, whoa, that took a turn. 
And usually it is where they like, rather than saying, okay, so the problem is, you know, capitalism and fossil fuel extraction will be, so the problem is the Jews or like the problem is the blacks or, you know, something like that. And so I think it's, I, for me, I'm trying to think through that is like, they may be anti-state, but they are fine with certain other important forms of oppression um, and coercion and hierarchy. And also I think their idea of freedom is more on the kind of individualistic autonomy level as opposed to the idea of collective liberation, the idea of like, what is a system and a structure that enables maximum freedom and equality for everybody? They care, I think, more about their own in-group. Right. So yeah. I don't know, I think, I think it's a mistake to generalize. I think there's a lot of different things going on. I think, yeah, you're definitely, you're, you're absolutely right about that. Um, I, I think maybe, maybe if there's a, a, a real fundamental uh, dividing line, it's that right-wing anti-statists tend to do this, do exactly what the state wants them to do, which is to focus on one particular group or person even as the other, as the thing that, the thing that is holding us back and to, and to not look at it in a more complex way. So it could be the Jews or the migrants or, uh, you know, uh, or, or, or Black Lives Matter or something. There's always something they fixate on. Whereas um, I, think, I think, you know, if we're, if we're doing our job on the left, what we're trying to do is, is come up with a, with a, a, a much more, a, a, more, a more thoughtful analysis of, 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 of what's out there that's, that's holding us back. Gosh, yeah, we could we could do an entire hour and a half just on conspiratorialism on both the left and the right, um, which is just such a uh, a rabbit hole. We we got a couple uh, great questions in the Q and A box, and I, I want to call attention to um, one that takes us in a slightly different direction, um, which is this question of to what extent uh, modern states compete or cooperate with each other, um, uh, and uh, and uh, I guess the question goes on to ask, would replacing the state likely mean replacing states um, like everywhere all at once? Like, is this a, is this a situation where, um, you know, it's sort of like global or nowhere? Like to what extent can this be uh, a localized phenomena? Well, that's really two questions. I mean, let's say the, the, the first one really has to do with, sorry, was, um, uh, could you, can you repeat the first question? Yeah, the first question was just about the, the nature of state cooperation and competition. Like, uh, yeah. like you know, we're in we're in a world where you have these very theatrical conflicts between you know China and the United States, um, East and West, uh, the Soviet Union and the free world, uh, or whatever. Um, you know, and, and at the same time, there's obviously investment on the part of all states in ensuring that territories don't fall into statelessness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. I think the the um, the the answer to that is is and I I've uh, this is something I try and put across in the book is that is that there's a tendency when we look at at the history of the modern world and this the sort of sociology of it uh, of of the, the you know of the political structures that we have there's a tendency to uh, to build it around the conflicts between states that that's that's the motor of history is always the conflicts between states. When in reality, I think a lot of the action is really in how they cooperate. It's, you know, I, um, I find very interesting, for example, uh, systems of papers, you know, passports, things like this that have been decided on a kind of an international level. And we're from the beginning. That's one of the first things that you started to see when the modern state took shape was all of a sudden people had to have papers to go from one place to another. Um, uh, you know, um, uh, cooperation between police forces around the world, uh, uh, international law, um, all the ways in which states have not only, this is one of the phenomenons of the modern state is it's not just individual states, they've always formed a kind of a system that reinforces each other, where, the, where they reinforce each other, um, that, that you, can, you, you can't just talk about states as sort of, you know, little individual things that squabble. They've, there's always been a, a uh, an attempt to get them to knit together and cooperate, um, and they have to, because uh, they, uh, you know, they, they're in, in a lot of ways they couldn't exist if they didn't if they didn't do that, and that goes right back to the beginning as well. Um, so I think the 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 reality is that 
uh, states cooperate a lot more than you might think. I mean, it's, it's ways in ways that we take kind of for granted um, and that they reinforce each other. And, and, and I think that that gets to your second question, which I, I, I didn't, I don't have a, a, a really firm answer for you. You know, does, do we overthrow all states all at once or do we, or do we, or do we do it piecemeal? You know, I, um, I think that, uh, I think that um, one thing I would say, if, if we want to, even, if we even want to get rid of one state, we probably have to organize across state boundaries. It has to be somewhat international uh, because I think that, uh, again, as, as you were saying, liberty is that, is that, the, is that states have sort of a poor vacuum. If they see us, if they see, see the state collapsing in one place, they rush in to try and fill the, fill the gap. Uh, and so I think that, that, um, that you have to be, you have to be organizing opposition to the state in more than one place at any particular time. And there have, there has to be links between the groups that are doing it. Uh, we don't see a whole lot of that now. I mean, this is why I was very supportive of uh, solidarity with Rajava, for example, because I think that it's absolutely essential for people in different places to, to, to help these experiments keep going. Um, but I, I don't have a I don't have a firm a firm you know crystal ball answer as far as as uh, whether we 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 uh, whether we smash the whole thing at once or we smash it in pieces. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I kind of maybe one way to think about it is if like all of the different states and sometimes you'll hear you know in kind of a foreign policy terms enemies allies and rivals. And like, it's like they're playing the same game. They're all involved in the same tournament. So they may be playing against each other in the game, but they are still all playing the game. And they have an interest in upholding the rules of that game. They're not coming in and like smashing all the pieces off the board or like, you know, blowing up the field. They're still all playing the game, even, even if they're playing against each other. So yeah, I think um, it seems really difficult for a group that's trying to evade state control or overthrow state control or resist state control to establish itself safely um, in a stateless way because like the only, you know, what do you do to keep someone out of your territory? You need a border, even if you wanna maintain a kind of an autonomous sovereign area, it still has a border that you have to defend if all the states are trying to come in and claim you or smash you. So it does seem like, difficult to remain stateless in an interstate system. So yeah, in theory, I do think they would all have to be, the, the entire game would have to end, not just one or the other player be um, beaten on that field. So I guess the only thing I, you know, I don't have a great crystal ball answer either, aside from, yeah, like solidarity, that's great um, in material ways, not just moral ways. But um, the fact that there's been so many right-wing neo-fascist or, or not neo, but just fascist populist movements, authoritarian leaders rising all over the world. This is something that's like happening in so many places in the past few years makes me think that if that can happen, why couldn't the opposite thing also happen? If we're all in various parts of the world responding to shared conditions and who knows, maybe ecological crisis, which does affect the entire globe can be a context in which um, similar responses are in many places could be possible. Right, right. I find that very encouraging, actually. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I, y'all know that I um, love speculative fiction and sci-fi fantasy. So I, just hearing hearing y'all talk about this question of like, you know, how, how is it, how do we take it apart? Um, I, I was just reminded, uh, y'all may be familiar with, uh, I think, a short story by um, Philip K. Dick called The Last of the Masters, um, yeah, which yeah. envisions a post-revolutionary society in which there is, uh, this is totally a tangent, um, uh, essentially like a global anarchist, uh, for lack of a better term, police force that are tasked with going around and making sure that no one starts a state. Um, anyway, it's a, it's a, it's an interesting kind of story that I think plays with this idea of um, to what extent is authoritarianism anywhere a threat to freedom everywhere, and like how do you how do you maintain freedom um, in a in a in a global kind of context? You could say freedom anywhere is a threat to authoritarianism everywhere. It, absolutely, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it must be opposed. <laughs> 
So we're coming towards the end of our time together. This has been a really stimulating conversation. Um, unfortunately, there are uh, more questions that have been submitted in the last little bit than we'll get to. Um, but I think we've got time for one more. I don't know if y'all are looking at the questions people have offered up, if there's something there we can, can tackle in the next five minutes before we wrap up for the evening. Or maybe Liberty, could we say them? Because then even if we don't have time to answer them, then everybody can kind of be thinking about them anyway. Yeah, totally. Um, so there was, there was an interest in maybe talking a little bit more about the question of um, like violent criminality and how that perhaps sort of fills the gaps within the state system in ways that aren't possible. This is, this is now me editorializing a little bit, but like, like to what extent um, does that, does criminality potentially fill gaps that can't be filled by say the um, de jure like police system and things like that. Um, uh, so somebody, uh, Justin was asking if we might elaborate a little bit on the role of criminality within the state. Um, and then uh, CP asked about um, modern states uh, forming a system um, that might be uh, different or similar to the systems that were used um, in the colonization of uh, the African and Asian continents. Um, so both, I think both questions that touch on things we've already uh, discussed, but maybe a request to go a little bit deeper with those topics. Yeah. Um... Uh, just to, uh, 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 can, you, can you reiterate the part about African Asia? Yeah, so the question was, how are modern states forming a system now different from when they formed systems to colonize African and Asian continents? So mm -hmm. I, I think perhaps yeah. this is a question about the sort of the evolution of colonialism. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think in, 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 in much more... Um, uh, sophisticated ways, unfortunately. Um, in the case of uh, China, for example, um, you have uh, methods, and again, uh, I mean, uh, what, I, what I'm saying here is based on the reports I've, I've read about what uh, the, the, the Beijing government is doing in Xinjiang and Tibet, for example. Um, but the uh, and, and I give them some credence because this is the kind of the thing that the state does these days. But uh, the, the methods of um, sort of uh, performing a kind of a, uh, 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 a, a cultural, um, uh, uh, cultural annihilation and of um, uh, hemming in and closing off political opportunities to people are way more sophisticated now that, than they were uh, 100 or 150 years ago. And that they involve um, technology, multiple forms of coercion. Uh, there is, it's, it's very, very challenging. And um, uh, this is a way in which the state, I think, I think learns from itself, that states mimic each other's behavior and learn from each other's behavior uh, and, uh, and, then, and then build on, on what they've learned. Um, so I think that, that in the case of, uh, of, of Asia, for example, you have a European system that's being uh, adapted and moved in, in new directions by other states that have, uh, that have uh, taken over the form. And um, it's complicated and it's, it's an even bigger challenge for us, but there it is. Final thoughts from, from either of you uh, to send us out um, tonight? I mean, I guess I could just real fast say, yeah, yeah. Um, or regarding that last question, I, I don't think it's a different system. I think after, in the second half of the 20th century, after World War II, you had a decolonization of Africa and Asia formation of a lot of new states. They joined the UN, they formed the Bandung movement, Afro-Asian solidarity movement. These are efforts at solidarity and sovereignty and decolonization. But I think the fact is they've joined the interstate system and they're replicating these state behaviors in many cases. They are very authoritarian in many cases. So it's not just because you're in the global South and once we're colonized doesn't mean you can't also be an oppressive state. So I think for me, this answer, which I always, always come back to is like the state, the nation state cannot be a good vehicle of liberation and decolonization. And so that kind of just reinforces Eric's whole 
point and the whole like we need a different operating system, we need a different world system. Sorry, I was, I was trying to talk, talk really fast there. <laughs> No, I, I, you, you, could, you couldn't have said it better as far as I'm concerned. Thanks, Maya. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that's a, a great note to go out on. This has been an awesome conversation. I, I will say from reading the book, there's just so much content here that it, uh, it was impossible that we would really touch on all of the really wonderful and insightful points that are made within the book. Um, some great histories that are explored uh, in these pages. And I would just really encourage everyone who tuned in tonight to pick up a copy of the book. Um, if you can afford to do so, buy one from our co-op. It'll support us. It'll support AK Press, which is a, a wonderful radical publisher. Um, if you don't have the funds to do that, go to your library, make sure they've got a copy. Um, but this is a good one to read, a good one to talk about with friends. And thank you again so much, um, Eric and Maya, for being with us tonight. This has been a real pleasure. Thanks. Can I, can I just add one thing? I, I, I hope people will read this book and, and, and write and, and become part of this conversation because I think there's so much more we need to know. I've tried to provide a kind of an introduction, but I, I, I really hope I'm going to be reading and, 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 and talking with people about this topic in, in, in greater depth for a long, long time now because I think we need to. Absolutely. Great. I think, I think that's it for this evening. Um, I hope everybody has a lovely night. Um, take care and please do uh, join us again for um, uh, upcoming events, which hopefully will be as stimulating as tonight. Thanks so much. <laughs>